All right. Hello, Dean Rays. How are you today, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Good to be back. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we want to welcome everybody to episode three of Music and Criminal Justice for Foreign with our host, Dean Rays. Um, you know, in our last episode, we learned about the disparate impact of the criminal justice system on black and brown communities. We learned a lot about the beginnings of Last Prisoner Project and how the cannabis industry has become more involved with the fight for justice. So I am thrilled for today's show to dive further into those themes. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to skedaddle here. But while before I do that, Dean, can you tell us what we're in store for today? Yes. Uh, thanks, as always, Reed and Rootfire for providing the... Uh, the platform for us to to do these video sessions and um you know from the 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 first conversation we had we uh discussed doing one on uh on music and uh i i've been paying attention to the root fire tv community and seeing um you know how many how many music industry uh, uh people had been doing these sessions and i realized you know thomas cousins had done his and uh, Igor Katz had done his and Brian Sandell and Dan Sheehan. So I wanted to talk about something other than music. And uh, I'm very, you know, passionate about criminal justice reform and trying to do what I can to, you know, to make the world a better place. And so we decided on a kind of a platform and, and realized that uh, I had all these incredible people that I, that I knew and I figured I'd just try to call them and ask them questions about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and figured we would use that as the platform to let anybody who wanted to tune in and, and watch. So um, I have been talking to, to Ben for, uh, we met, uh, not in person. This is actually our first face-to-face. -face. This is what I look like. Glad to see <laughs> what you look like. And uh, so we've been talking on the phone a bunch, and um, I'm just 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 really in awe of everything that 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 he's done and just wanted to ask a bunch of questions. So that's what brought us here. And that's uh, what we're going to be doing today is, is, um, you know, asking Ben some questions and having a dialogue and uh, try to get a better understanding of, of what everybody's doing and what we can do. And uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So uh, everybody, uh, just a reminder, if you've got questions that you'd like to ask of Ben and Dean, please put them in the in the uh, the live comments. We can see those popping up. And without further ado, I'm going to get out of here and welcome Ben Cohen, activist and co-founder of Ben and Jerry's. Thanks, guys. Hey, hey. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, rocking. I'm uh, here in Vermont. It's... Uh, Late fall, the, the 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 colors on the trees are now on the ground, and uh, you know, just here talking to you, Dean. Very nice. Thank you so much for uh, for 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 giving us the time. And you know, like I said uh, in the intro, that um, you know, the the objective of these is to I'm I'm learning a lot. We're all learning a lot, uh, and you know, trying to to do what we can, um, you know, and, and understand more about the world and, and how we can make it better. And so I figured I would ask you to come on. You're doing incredible things and have been for many years. So um, I guess maybe we can start with how we met, which is, you know, a, a great story and, and interesting. And so I knew, I know Tamara Moritz, who is a data analyst in the cannabis industry, and she introduced me to... Um, uh, to, to Mr. Menken, who uh, met you at a Bernie rally or a conference somewhere, and you guys were somewhere sharing a joint, and you told him about Lost Prisoner Project, and he connected us via email, and that was about a year and a half ago. And now we've been talking about your launching a, your own cannabis brand, which we can get into. But that's kind of my side of the story. Uh, how, how did you meet him, and what you know? What? How did just a random? It just kind of shows that. You never know who you're going to meet. You're standing outside of a conference somewhere and you're sharing life stories on a joint and all of a sudden you're like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm I'm Ben Cohen. Uh, who are you? So how, how did how did you meet him? It, well, I'm I'm glad that you uh, that you talked about how we met, because I <laughs> couldn't remember. Uh, I knew it had something to do with Bernie. Uh, and that's kind of all I remember. 
Got it. Okay. Well, um, I'm just glad we've met. And uh, <laughs> yeah. we started talking about originally about Last Prisoner Project. And um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm just, just really impressed with everything that you're doing. And so I, I, I saw you, I don't want to go into, and people can look it up online about how you started Ben and Jerry's and all of your years, because we don't have, we don't have that much time. So I'd like to get into, you know, some, some deeper questions that, that I have, which is, um, you know, Ben and Jerry's is, is a company that is obviously massive and they're taking a stand, they're taking big risks. Um, and you have for years brought up a lot of issues in America, uh, you know, uh, eradicating white supremacy, uh, systemic racism, criminal justice reform, um, school to prison pipelines, and speaking up about all of these issues. Why did you decide to do that? Because as a large company, you could turn away a lot of people and you can, you know, there, for, for people that are watching that are passionate about cause entrepreneurship and, 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 you know, having a message and standing for something, you could have just not done anything. So what was it that that you guys decided to to speak out and you know in in the wake of george floyd's murder and a lot of americans becoming aware of of the deep rooted uh racism in america ben and jerry's just came right out and they were like everyone was like we need to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and ben and jerry's was like slapped everyone across the face as an outline was like no we need to eradicate white supremacy so what is like what happens at the company and and what was it and how did you guys decide to, to have such a loud voice? Right. Well, uh, <laughs> that, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Jerry and I are uh, friends from junior high. We were in the same uh, gym class together. We were the two slowest, fattest kids running around the track. And that's, that's how we bonded. Um, and then, uh, you know, we were both uh, kind of failures uh, in later life. Uh, Jerry was trying to become a, a doctor and couldn't get into med school. And I was trying to become a, a potter and nobody would buy my pottery. Uh, and we said, well, uh, we're not getting anywhere. You know, we may as well try starting our own business. And since the only thing we liked doing really was eating, uh, we decided it would be a food business and it, and it ended up being ice cream. And, you know, at, at the beginning, uh, you know, we opened in a, in an oil gas station, uh, on an investment of, uh, $8,000. And, uh, you know, we thought that we would, you know, have this business, uh, keep it for a few years and then sell it and, buy a, a, a tractor trailer and become cross country truck drivers. That was, that was the plan. And, uh, you know, then the, the business really took off and, uh, and, and so we didn't, we didn't get the tractor trailer and, uh, we kept doing ice cream and, you know, after, Oh, I don't know, three, four or five years, uh, we felt like we were just becoming uh, another cog in the economic machine that tends to oppress a lot of people, that uh, exploits the environment, uh, exploits its employees, uh, exploits the community. And, uh, you know, we, we, we thought, well, Maybe, you know, we should get out of this because, you know, we, we felt like we were no longer ice cream men, but we had become businessmen, uh, you know, dealing with hiring and firing and accountants and lawyers and memos and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, trying to repay our bank loans. And, uh, yeah, we thought this this was this was not us. This is not what we wanted to be. And. I had met, uh, I, I was the uh, truck driver. I was the route sales guy. And, and I had met on the route this, this older kind of eccentric restaurant tour. And I had gotten friendly with him. And I told him, you know, we were planning on selling the business. And he said, you know, how could you possibly do that? How could you, you know, the business is just starting. It has so much potential in front of it. And I said, 
you know, Maurice, you know what business does. It exploits these guys, those guys. And he said, you know, Ben, if there's something you don't like about business, why don't you just do it different? And that had not really occurred to us before, but we decided to conduct an experiment and see if it's possible that business is just a neutral tool like a hammer and you can use it to destroy things or you can use it to, to build things. And, and we decided to see if it was possible for business to be a force for social change. Uh, and, you know, we, we thought odds are we were going to fail. You know, it hadn't really been done before. Uh, and, uh, and look at you now. It didn't fail. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the, what we started uh, saying to people is that, uh, you know, all of the advisors, the accountants, the lawyers, et cetera, the financiers were saying, uh, you know, this is going to be your undoing. Uh, you're going to go out of business. It's, it's not possible for business to uh, solve social problems and make a profit at the same time. And we decided to, to try it. And, you know, what, what we discovered was that solving social problems, repairing, you know, the, 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 the problems in the society are just another set of our customers' needs. I mean, yeah, they want to eat great ice cream and they would also like to solve these problems in, in our society. And uh, so interestingly enough, as, as we kept on doing more and more stuff to address societal problems and repair, uh, you know, ills, uh, people started buying more and more ice cream. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing that happened was that, uh, you know, different organizations, business organizations, uh, you know, co business schools, you know, would ask Jerry and I to come and speak and, uh, you know, various news media would ask to do interviews with us. And, uh, you know, we decided that, if we have this platform, we're gonna we're not gonna use this platform to talk about oh this is the best ice cream in the world. We're gonna use it to talk about addressing social problems. Um, and the other interesting thing is that uh, yeah, people say well you can't address social problems because they're they're controversial. Uh, and the reality is that if you're gonna if you're gonna stand up for something, by nature, by definition, it's gonna be controversial. You know, if everybody agreed on it, you wouldn't need to take a stand on it. Right. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. And the other thing I, I need to, you know, just make people aware of is that. Uh, you know, as the company grew, uh, we had a we had what was the first ever in-state public stock offering, and we essentially sold stock in our company to Vermonters. Uh, it was an you know we had loads of offers from venture capitalists, essentially a whole bunch of already wealthy people who wanted to make more money, and we decided instead to use this need for cash to make the community the owners of the business so that as the business prospered, the community would automatically prosper. And, you know, we did that and, and it worked really good. Uh, so many people in Vermont sent their kids to college on Ben and Jerry's. Um, That's great. But, but eventually the business got sold. Uh, that was something that Jerry and I, resisted we didn't want it to happen but we had become a publicly held company and uh you know there was there was no no choice in the matter so in 2000 the company uh became owned by 
Unilever and you know Jerry and I are no longer active in the day-to-day uh, you know management of the business where we're not involved in decision making or any of that stuff but before the company was sold at, as it was you know just getting larger and larger Jerry and I made a very conscious decision that we wanted to infuse the values. We wanted to infuse the social values into the fabric of the company. Uh, it was, you know, it was a difficult task. We, again, we, we thought the chances of us being successful at it uh, were slim, but uh, incredibly enough, uh, we did. And, you know, when when the company came out with that stance on dismantling white supremacy, Jerry and I had nothing to do with it. And we see that as the greatest testament to what we were able to do at, at Ben and Jerry's, that we did successfully infuse those values. And I, I just can't tell you how how proud I am, uh, you know, to have my name on the lid. Yeah, that's great. Is there, um, do you know how they, how they do that? I know you said you're not involved operationally or, or even like, you know, before your time, was there somebody whose role it was to handle all of that messaging and decide what, you know, what those values are going to be and how you're going to message them out? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, while I was still, uh, you know, the CEO of the company and then actively involved in the management, uh, it was pretty much Jerry and myself that were kind of making those decisions. Uh, but when the company got sold, well, I mean, even before the company got sold, we hired a person whose job was to integrate the social mission in the day-to-day -day activities of the company. And uh, they work internally with, with everyone at the company, with all the departments. And, uh, and then when the company got sold, uh, there was an unusual purchase and sale agreement uh, whereby an independent board of directors was created for Ben & Jerry's. Um, a lot of the original members of that were members of the original board of Ben and Jerry's. Now, a lot of them have trans transitioned off, but there was a very intentional effort to make sure that that board was comprised of activists, minorities, uh, women, uh, you know, with a few old white guys sprinkled in. <laughs> and and uh, that's, they've been beautiful. I mean, they've, they've uh, you know, show, led the way for the company. And, and now the company has, you know, a, I don't know, they have like a, a five or six person social mission department. There's a social mission activism manager, and um, there's a lot of resources that are that are devoted to social social change. I mean, you know, right now the company has been very involved in uh, get out the vote efforts, uh, particularly uh, for young people who, who tend to not vote at a at a very high rate, but mm -hmm. have great values. Um, and, you know, the company uh, was very, very active in uh, the work in Florida to uh, make sure that ex-felons uh, had the right to vote, uh, people who had served their sentences. And, you know, I, I, you know, Jerry and I were involved in, uh, you know, the company worked with the Advancement Project and the ACLU to... Uh, shut down the workhouse, which was an infamous prison in St. Louis, uh, 
where 90 some odd percent of the people there uh, had not been convicted of a crime, but they were people that were too poor to post bail. And most of them were black and brown people. And uh, there was an incredibly powerful local organization there and, and we joined with them and we won. Shut it down. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I mean, we can spend hours talking about, uh, you know, how America is a carceral state and how, you know, um, it's a modern form of slavery, really. Uh, you know, cheap labor and you can't vote. And, uh, you know, it's obviously incredibly racist. Um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is I'm, I'm very aware of my, of, as aware as I can be, of my white male privilege and realizing that, there is a small chance that I would get arrested for cannabis possession or smoking cannabis and get put in jail because of a racial bias and b I, I can post you know the, the bond, but a lot of people are not in that position or post the bail. There is a, a story that about you how you got caught smoking cannabis and didn't get arrested and very similarly were then able to get your loan to start the company. Can you tell that story about? what happened and what could have happened if that wasn't the case? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, a few friends of mine and I were uh, at a beach in the evening uh, and we were passing a day around underneath a, uh, a lifeguard chair. And, uh, you know, we're looking around to, you know, make sure nobody was watching and, uh, you know, and then we see these these two white lights coming at us kind of fast. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, we said, whoa, it's the cops. Uh, you know, eat the J, eat the J. And, uh, you know, the cops came. Uh, they had their flashlights. They're looking all around. They're <laughs> they're scuffing. You know, you know, they're kicking, kicking the sand around and they come up with this half a J that the guy who was supposed to eat the J didn't eat. And uh, you gotta eat the J. You have to eat <laughs> you the J. Eat the J. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they they arrested us, they handcuffed us, uh, put us in the back of a, a patrol car and uh, took us to the station and strip searched us. And uh, and eventually, you know, I remember the cop there unrolling the J and he said, Hey man, this is all full of uh, twigs and seeds. You're really going to smoke this? <laughs> and uh, they, we ended up getting off with a ticket for lighting for littering a lighted cigarette butt on the ground. And you know, there's little doubt in my mind that uh, if we were some young black guys uh, instead of some young white guys. Uh, we probably would have ended up in jail with a record, not been able to open Ben and Jerry's because we had a record, not be able to get a loan because we had a record, and there never would have been a Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, it's a it's a similar or familiar story, and the data doesn't lie that that probably you know would have been the case, and that's that's kind of a, a great example, which um, I'd love you to to talk a little bit about. Uh, systemic systemic racism and I hate to just get so dark and talk about dark subjects so I do want to talk about some fun stuff but that's kind of just one example that that I doing these have continued to learn more about is like well well we look at it now and why there is America has uh, a, a lot of issues with systemic racism and white supremacy but how did we get here so going back to uh, equality back to redlining, uh, you know, back to uh, mass incarceration, back to slavery. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, on how we got here and, and what, what do you think we can do to end all of that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, redlining uh, was official government policy. It's in black and white, in the regulations, regarding uh, low interest government backed mortgages uh, that the government was giving out to white people, but specifically excluding black people from. 
uh, in black and white is the regulation that uh, these loans cannot be made into uh, areas where black people were living. And, and so it was redlined on a map. And that's where the term comes from. And they went so, so, so you know, so some black people said, uh, okay, uh, give me a loan in, uh, in a white community, for a house in a white community. And the government said, oh, no, can't do that, because if we give you a loan in a white community, then it's a black community. Uh, so, and, and, you know, interestingly enough, you think about the issue of generational wealth. Uh, you think, you know, for me, my parents were poor. Uh, they were able to build equity by buying a house with that government loan that was denied to white, to black people. And, you know, and it was because of that uh, wealth that they were able to build. I mean, they didn't become very wealthy, but, you know, they, they, they were able to have some equity. And it was because of that equity that I was able to, you know, attend a good college, uh, even though I dropped out. Uh, Me too. But, you're, you're a good company. <laughs> but, you know, that's not an opportunity that's available to uh, black people whose families were not able to create that general generational wealth due to uh, redlining. And, you know, the other reality is that, uh, you know, most people when they start go to start a small business, they hit up uh, you know, their, their family, uh, aunts and uncles, uh, you know, for, to loan them some money. And for, for white people, there's, there's a high percentage of them where, you know, they've got a, a relative that has a little money that they can loan them. I mean, my father loaned me 4,000 bucks. Uh, and for black people that, because of the redlining, because of the issue of generational wealth, it, it's not there. Right, right. Yeah, that seemed, that's just one of the issues. And same with incarceration. If you you know, if your parents are, you know, racially profiled and thrown in jail and can't afford the bail, then you can't have the same opportunities as somebody whose parents can help them out in situations like that. Um, I, yeah, and oftentimes you end up growing up without your parent around because the parent is in jail for stuff that I got a ticket for littering for. Right. Right. I had a similar situation. I was on, uh, on a beach in Southern California when I had first moved to America and I was with some friends and we were drinking beers around a bonfire in Corona del Mar. And, uh, you know, the cops came up and found the beers and just like, you know, told us to just put it away and go home. But that couldn't have been the case, you know, so thankfully I, you know, we got away, but public intoxication, minoring, you know, having alcohol, like it's not, it's, you know, it's not something you get thrown in jail for life, but it's just one example that, that kind of really struck me. On a lighter note, what are your three Desert Island albums? Like if you were on a Desert Island and you had, you could bring three albums. What, yeah. what, what do you, what do you, what, what are you listening to? What would those be? Uh, you know, uh, I love, the Grateful Dead, Working Man's Dead, and American Beauty. Uh, those songs, I mean, you know, the Grateful Dead gets credit for it. You know, it was it was Robert Hunter who wrote the lyrics. Uh, but, Rest in peace. you know, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the dead that 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 created this this amazingly beautiful spirit and vibe around them. Uh, so it'd be those two. And, uh, you know, lately I've, I've really been uh, getting into jazz. Uh, you know, Stan Getz, A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square is, you know, just really touches my soul. Uh, I'd put that on and, and can, I, can, I, can I add a fourth? You can add seven if you want. This is, this is music and criminal justice reform. So I want to make sure we talk a little bit about 
music and so go yeah go five six seven let's talk about music for a minute uh taj mahal uh you know is a um there's a song uh which is actually an instrumental uh you know that isn't one of his most popular songs i mean he's got fish and blues and that's that's fun but this is a song called ain't gone whistle dixie no more and again it, it just that music uh speaks speaks to my my soul and my my spirit and i you know it it, it gives me it, it gives me a tremendous sense of uh you know contentment and and joy that's great um which kind of segs into the 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 partnerships with uh fish and jerry garcia how did those happen and why did you guys do that maybe a little story about how you landed up creating these flavors out of these musicians and how i mean jerry garcia i mean did you have the expectation that it would just be a, just a massive is it i mean a huge seller for you i would assume it's everywhere probably among yeah. your top few it's, uh, it's uh, flavors so how, how did that happen and, and what's the story there uh you know jerry and i were minding our own business and uh you know we used to get and we still do uh you know get a whole bunch of mail uh at the time it was you know like letters you know like people would write uh put it in an envelope uh that kind of mail and uh uh, and and Jerry really wanted to answer each one of those letters individually, and he would write back to to everybody who who wrote to us. And uh, you know he was always walking around with this big pile of letters that he had to you know scrawl his little thing on and. So he saw all these uh, flavor suggestions as they came in, and they were this this the one for Cherry Garcia came in on a postcard. It was anonymous. It said uh, it it had a picture of Ronnie Reggae on the front. It was this illustration of Ronald Reagan doing the some kind of reggae dance, and uh, <laughs> and. Uh, on the back, uh, what they wrote was, uh, we're, we're real Ben and Jerry's fans, and, and we love the Grateful Dead, and we think you should come out with a flavor called Cherry Garcia, because it would be a real hoot for the fans, and dead paraphernalia always sells. And, you know, as I said, uh, you know, the dead was, it's what got me through uh, you know, difficult times for me in, in, in my college years. And, uh, I mean, you know, lyrics about like box of rain and ripple. I mean, those are, uh, you know, <laughs> a big part of my life philosophy even today. Yeah. My, my wife's dance at our wedding with my father-in-law was ripple. Ah, beautiful. They did the, they did the, the father daughter dance to ripple. Oh, that's so it's, 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 it's deep in our lives too. Uh huh. So, uh, you know, so, you know, coming up with a flavor named Cherry Garcia, a tribute to Jerry Garcia was a huge uh, undertaking. I mean, I, you know, how am I going to come up with a flavor that's des deserving of, uh, you know, being associated with, with Jerry Garcia? And uh, it took me. Uh, over a year uh, to come up with the flavor. Uh, my, my initial idea was that it would be something like, uh, you know, there used to be these uh, little uh, chocolate covered liquid center cherries that were by the cash register in places where you checked out, you could buy them at singles. And, uh, you know, it was a, a dark chocolate coating and a, and a cherry inside and some liquid. And uh, I thought, you know, what we ought to do is kind of like smash these up and put it into some ice cream. And I tried that and it, it really didn't work. 
<laughs> and, you know, and then I tried just chocolate coating cherries and, you know, the chocolate coating always fell off and that didn't really work. And then I decided, well, we'll put the cherries in separate from the chocolate. Uh, and I wanted to put in, you know, I'm very into big chunks, uh, you know, because I don't really have much of a sense of taste and texture is very big for me. And uh, so I wanted to put in whole cherries and uh, chocolate um, chips. And uh, the problem was that in whole cherries, uh, there's always some pits uh because that's the state of the art in terms of whole cherry pitting. They can't get them all. And, you know, if you're eating some ice cream and you chomp down on a pit, it's a, it's a bad thing. And uh, so uh, we couldn't use whole cherries. And then, you know, there's the issue of snap. You know, you know a, a fresh, good, not overly ripe, perfectly ripe cherry has, has a bunch of snap to it from the skin. Hmm. And uh, a lot of times when, you know, when you get cherries and, you know, that you lose that snap, you know, if you buy like a, a frozen cherry or a canned cherry and, you know, we weren't, you know, we're not able as an ice cream company to use fresh ones. And uh, so it took me a lot of work finding exactly the right species of cherry that maintained its snap then working with the process the cherry processor to make sure that they kept the snap and uh wow. and then and then you know and then you need to what am i getting into too much is this too much information oh, no if anybody watching this knows me they know <laughs> that i have a disastrous sweet tooth there is no there is no meal for me that involve that does not involve something sweet or some kind of dessert so uh, i was going to follow up with another ice cream question. So don't let me stop you talking about how you make ice cream. It's, it's fascinating. Please keep well, going. So, th so then there's the, the interaction, the balance of the uh, chocolate chunks and uh, the cherry. You know, you don't want one to overwhelm the other one. And the problem we were having is that if the, if the chip was big enough, uh, it was too hard in the ice cream and you know, you're in your mouth, you got these two things going on and you know, the, the cherry kind of fades away and you're, you're munching on this chip and that wasn't good. So we, 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 we came up with a, with a special formulation uh, and shape uh, for the chocolate so that it's actually softer when it's in ice cream, because you know, Chocolate at room temperature, it has one degree of hardness, but when you freeze it, it's really, really hard. And in this case, having it as thick as we want it to be, it was too hard. So we reformulated the chocolate to get a lower freezing point or a higher, I don't know, something or other, softer when it's frozen. That's pretty amazing to see how you come up with these flavors, which is going to be, which is my follow-up question is, what is that process? Do you just, do you sit down in like a, or in the early days when you did in like a brainstorming session going like, is there data research over it? Is there, you know, analysis or feedback or do you just go, let's, let's just see how it tastes. Like how did, how did you guys make all these incredible flavors? Uh, you know, at the beginning I was the head of R and D and I was also the head quality control person. Tough gig. I weighed 50 pounds more than I weigh today. <laughs> uh, and I was essentially channeling flavors from the collective flavor unconscious. Uh, there were flavors hanging around out there that uh, had not been created, that were obvious to me that this, you know, that they're flavors that people want. And, and, and you know, a big part of it in the ice cream industry and the food industry in general is that you tend not to get uh, foods produced in a way that people ideally want them because the production machinery is not designed to run products like that. And so what, what happens is that 
people that are, you know, creating ice cream flavors, they base it on what will run through the machines easily without coming up the works. And uh, at Ben & Jerry's, we, we just came up with the best flavors we possibly could and tweaked the machinery uh, so that we could produce it. Got it. Um, tell me a little bit about Grayson Bakery, how they make all your brownies, but they uh, employ the unemployable. They, it's a $20 million company that makes all the brownies. And correct me if I'm wrong, or I'd love you to explain, but they employ former felons, uh, the disabled, uh, people who can't get jobs, uh, homeless. Uh, what, what, what's the story there? How did, how did that come about? And what's that success story? Uh, Ben and Jerry's was, uh, producing, just starting to produce a brownie ice cream sandwich, two thin chewy brownies with ice cream in the middle. And we had, uh, you know, we had opened up a, a new factory that was exclusively devoted to making that product. And we were buying the you know, the brownies for it from a particular small supplier. And, and we realized that, you know, this whole factory was dependent on this brownie from a supplier that, uh, you know, was, was not really big and really established. And uh, we felt like we needed a, a secondary source for brownies in case something happened with that supplier. And Around that time, uh, Jerry and I received a letter in the mail from two guys we had never heard of before, Josh Mailman and Wayne Silby. And they said, uh, we are starting an organization of socially responsible businesses. Uh, that phrase had never been used before. And... Um, we're inviting, uh, you know, uh, 30, uh, 30 people from 30 businesses uh, to this meeting to, uh, to found this organization. And, uh, you know, we're paying for your, you know, your expenses while you're at this conference. You know, you, you need to get there. It was held in Colorado. And, uh, you know, it was it was a pretty interesting invitation. Uh, you know, of course, it was kind of free, and we liked that. Uh, but you know, we were trying really hard to figure out how to run our business in in a, a way that benefited the community as much as possible. And we were essentially, you know, kind of laughed at by the mainstream business community. So. You know, we were looking for, uh, you know, some like-minded people. And uh, so we went to that thing. And, uh, you know, it turns out that one of the guys who started it, Wayne Silby, he started the first and biggest socially responsible uh, mutual fund, Calvert Funds. Um, and, uh, you know, so we were there. And, and I ended up walking around uh, a little lake at this resort that this thing was held at uh, with a Jewish Buddhist nuclear physicist monk. Uh, and that monk was Bernie Glassman. And I just happened to be talking with him. Well, he, he mentioned to me uh, you know, I, I run this, uh, I lead this Buddhist community, uh, in, uh, inner city, New York. Uh, and in contrast to, to, to mainstream Buddhism, which is essentially very inner focused, he was very outer focused and, and he felt like his community needed to be working in the broader community and interacting with uh, the broader community and working to solve 
social problems in that low income area where they were based. And so he was ridiculed by the Buddhist establishment. And, and he mentioned that, you know, they, they had several enterprises, a child care thing and a construction thing. And, and another one was a bakery. Hmm. And uh, I said, wow, a bakery. We're looking for a secondary supplier for our brownies. And uh, wow, if you could supply a brownie that's essentially the same as the one we're using, we'll, we'll use you as a, you know, we'll, we'll buy our brownies from both uh, suppliers. And he said, yeah, no problem. I can do that. And uh, so we were both at the fringes of our re respective communities. And, um, and so, you know, we were, we were ordering, you know, we, we were ordering a truckload. Uh, that's, uh, what is it? 40,000 pounds, uh, 20 tons. That's what fits on a tractor trailer. Wow. Um, you know, when you're, you know, when you're making a lot of ice cream, that's the kind of, that's the way you yeah. get your supplies. And, yeah. uh, I said, you know, can you supply a, you know, a truckload? He said, Oh yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, then it turned out that, you know, he had never produced anything at that volume before. And that, you know, these things had to be, uh, frozen to preserve them. So he, he kept on making a bunch every day and putting it into this freezer, this walk-in freezer that he had there. And then finally he got together a tractor trailer's worth and sent it up to us. And, you know, our guys opened them, opened up these boxes of brownies on the production floor and uh, they were all stuck together in one, in one 40 pound block. And, uh, you know, I, I was taking a lot of shit for making a deal with this guy. And, uh, <laughs> and eventually, and, you know, and we weren't, you know, they were trying to pull them apart, but when they pulled them apart, it came off in pieces. And eventually we ended up saying, well, let's just create, uh, let's just create a flavor that uses these pieces. And that's how the flavor of chocolate fudge brownie came about. Wow. And now they deliberately make it in, small pieces and yeah we buy a lot of brownies from those guys and wow that's incredible and so they're based in uh, in new york yeah yonkers lower lower okay. yonkers uh just over the new york city line got it that's great and so i want to ask you about um you know when we first emailed and uh and we were introduced uh, i saw your email signature and it was you stamping a dollar bill yeah. and uh, you're a part of or founded this organization called stamp money out of politics. That's and right. So, and so on top of, you know, the, the campaign, you have 10,000 uh, Americans stamping dollar bills that says, please do not use this to influence our politicians. Um, how did you start that? Why did you start that? And what is the problem that, that we're trying to solve here? Uh, the major problem that we have is that, uh, we have, as they say, the best Congress that money can buy. Sure. Uh, the problem is that uh, political campaigns, uh, which every cycle cost in the billions of dollars, uh, are funded essentially by wealthy individuals and corporations. And it's it's what... John McCain uh, used to call legalized bribery uh, that, you know, corporations, uh, you know, are, are not giving huge donations to politicians, uh, you know, for any other reason except to help increase their bottom line. And so that's why you end up having laws uh, you know, like laws that allow carcinogenic chemicals uh, into the into the environment, uh, laws that allow uh, toxic chemicals in children's toys, laws that allow toxic chemicals to be used in the production of food. I mean, we could we could go on. I, you know, it's yeah. why it's why you have usurious uh, credit card interest rates. Uh, you know, the the, the politicians 
be, who are supposed to be representing the people don't represent the people, they represent the money. And uh, so the idea is to get money out of politics, uh, use, use a form of uh, public financing, uh, which would make it so that politicians are not answering to, uh, to business, to corporations and the ultra wealthy. What does public financing mean when it comes to, to politicians? You know, there's, uh, there's different versions of public financing. Uh, the one I like best is based on, uh, the democracy voucher system that they use in Seattle. Uh, where every person in Seattle gets a voucher of, I believe it's $100, uh, to use to support whatever politician they want to. And uh, so it puts everybody on an equal playing field, and politicians that participate in that have to refuse to take money from uh, you know, corporations, need to refuse to take large donations. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, another another possibility is uh, the system that's used in New York City, which is uh, a match uh, in New York City. I think it's a six to one match whereby, again, politicians who opt in to this system, uh, they can get donations from regular individuals and the city will match it six to one. Uh, and and that's been shown to be the amount that is enough to get the politician to say I'm not going to take big money. Um, so those are those are two possibilities. Got it. Got it. Okay, I'd love to see that. It's very yeah. frustrating to 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 just see this happen in broad daylight, and you know nobody really yeah I, knew I mean, anything about it. It's I, I mean it's. It's, you, know, you know, there's the idea of a social democracy, which is a democracy to benefit society as a whole. Uh, that's what they have in the Scandinavian countries. And what we have is corporate democracy, a democracy that's designed to benefit corporations. Um, you know, that, 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 that is a... Uh, a real bastardization of, of what the country was supposed to be about. <clears throat> right. Right. Well, thanks for all that work. Appreciate it. Um, there's some people here watching. If anybody has questions, uh, throw them in the chat and we'll throw them up. Um, I'm down to stay a little bit longer. Um, if there's any music or revolution or Duran Jones or Aaron Fraser questions or anything about that. Um, but yeah, I, I want to thank you for, coming on this program. Thanks to Rootfire for putting it on. Um, and so the original reason why we started speaking is because you are launching a cannabis company, which um, we, you and I originally got in touch about. Um, and so you want to talk about that at all? What is it? What's it called? Where does it come in? What can people be on the lookout for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this is the uh, actually the first unofficial, uh, non-announcement of, uh, the new cannabis company. It's, uh, uh, its purpose is to right the wrongs of the war on drugs and make great pot. And, uh, a hundred percent of its profits go to that issue of criminal justice reform. Uh, we'll be starting in, uh, Colorado, uh, hoping to open in uh, February. We're going to be uh, packaging some very high terpene, uh, kind of lower THC pre-rolls, and uh, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Great. Great. Very exciting. Well, thanks, Ben. Anything else you want to say or talk about or any other messages we've gotten gotten pretty deep got a little uh got some good info from you i asked all the questions that i that i wanted to know obviously like i said at the beginning of the program i'm not uh experienced or an expert in uh in in any any of this um but i am learning more and i am very passionate about it and i appreciate 
the conversations that I can have with people like you to guide and educate and try to make the world a better place. So thank you. Well, I just really appreciate the work that you're doing, Dean, with Steve D'Angelo and uh, the Last Prisoner Project. It is just so beautiful to see the momentum that that uh, project is gathering. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, it's 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 been really great. It's going so well, and and we have a really good team, uh, Sarah and Mary and Natalie and Steve and Andrew, um, and we're giving out a lot of money to to people whose parents are incarcerated. We're getting people out of jail. We're doing grants and funds and uh, giving you know money for college to kids, and um, and we're advising. Uh, uh, you know, politicians on how they can continue to get people out of jail. And it's, we've got a lot of support with incredible musicians and the Root Fire and Cali Roots community and people such as yourself. So um, thank you. Appreciate it. It's, it's, um, it's going very well and we have only just begun. So great to be working with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You too. All right. Um, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks Reed. I'm just going to hit the, uh, in broadcast here and I'll be back. I've got another episode coming for anyone who's watching and wants to tune in. Uh, it is with my friend, Jason Baldwin, who was one of the West Memphis three. He served 18 years on death row and was finally exonerated from a crime he did not commit. So he's going to be tuning in and we'll chat with him. I'll announce the date at another time. And his, uh, his partner and his nonprofit, they're called Proclaim Justice, John Harden. And uh, their goal is to use uh, investigative evidence and um, and uh, uh, try and get people out of jail that are innocent and should not be there, such as Jason. I can't imagine just being a guy going about your life as a as a you know a young adult and getting thrown in jail and put on death row for a crime you did not commit. Thankfully, he got out. But he's going to tell us all about that process and what they're doing to continue their mission. So whenever that comes around, I'll announce it. But that's that's the next episode, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Good to be with you on the yeah. journey for justice. Yeah, thank you. We'll keep going. Take See care. Ya. Bye.